Hello, everyone, and welcome to Women in Data Science Subotica 2020 online edition. I promise I am the only man you're going to see tonight. We are very proud to host the WID Subotica Online 2020. Uh, my name is Jelko Cerniakovic, and we are InfoSuit Hub. This event should have been uh, done live in our uh, main uh, uh, hub and, and uh, events hall, but due to the pandemic, we had to move it online. So we are here for you with five amazing talks and some Q&A sessions. So WIDS is basically uh, a conference that started at Stanford in November 2015. Since then, it grew to a worldwide conference, including 150 regional events. Let's check out the welcome message from WITS. Data science and any data-inspired and data-driven science is so critical right now. More and more decisions are made based on data. The amount of data that we gather every day and the insights that the data can provide us is just growing exponentially, and that is no exaggeration. The market for data science and related areas like AI is booming. It is so important to have women in artificial intelligence in the area of data science and also in leadership roles. It's being able to use data to solve issues and understand bigger problems. It's critical. And we need women in these roles. Every individual brings their own perspective. And so we need to make sure the entire workforce is represented. And the good news is there's so many jobs and many different ways to combine their passion area and their skills in data science and get involved. I would like you to say, what are the problems in the world that absolutely have to be changed? And you know, can you individually, given all the amazing background that you've had so far and all the education that you've got so far, what are the unique things that you can do to change the world towards that mission? And then think of the technology. If that is going to become completely data-driven over time, then you can't miss that opportunity. You've got to join in and, 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 and have your say. If you're not looking at the data from all sorts of different angles, then you could introduce a lot of bias. So it's really, really important that we have around the table all genders, uh, all races, all backgrounds. We can't ignore social and structural problems. We can't just go in a, in a corner and write some code and read math and then we're, that's, that's the solution, right? We can't do that. So we have to think about who is being affected by these algorithms. Welcome to WINS! <laughs> when we first started this conference, we never would have imagined that we'd be sitting here today with over 200 regional events. We've got over 500 WIDS ambassadors worldwide. Many of them are women, but we've also got a lot of men. And these are people who are just passionate about inspiring others within their community. We're in over 60 countries, and year after year, we're blown away. Let's make this next decade, the women in the data science uh, decade. What I love about it is that that growth is viral. That people will attend one event in one city and then they'll want to bring it to their cohort or colleagues the next year. This type of industry can be done everywhere, so it should be accessible to everybody. And this is one of the reasons why I love that we are global with this. So we wanted to create opportunities for women to inspire, educate, and support women at many different times throughout the year. And one way that we decided we could do that was through a data-thon every year, which is a predictive analytics challenge using real-world data. We have over 900 teams from 85 countries, and that's in every continent except Antarctica. When we started WITS in 2015, we had no idea this was going to be a global movement with tons of international events and a data-thon and a podcast show and 
and now outreach to middle school and high school has just been such a ride. Our latest endeavor is to work on some materials that we can hand off to teachers in schools around the world. This has provided a platform for literally hundreds of women, if not thousands of women, to have an opportunity to be heard. But the truth is, these are really simple experiments, but they had a profound impact because they empowered someone else to be able to do their job better or to be able to take that message. Five years ago, when we were sitting around a coffee table thinking about what WIDS could be, I never in my wildest dreams thought it would grow so far and so wide around the world in just five years. But what I'm most excited about is the next five years, because I think this is really just the start. Wow, so we know what WIDS is. So let's talk about our event. Our event is WIDS Subotica 2020, this time online, and it's happening for the second time. And it couldn't have happened without the help of our main organizer and WIDS ambassador, Tatiana Ketsevich, who is a data scientist with a doctorate in statistics from the University of Manchester. Tatiana has been a really a mastermind in, in pulling together the entire uh, women in data science community and data science communities and, and doing a lot of work uh, with courses in R and statistics and data science and a lot of things. So I want to uh, introduce Tatiana like this, and I also want to uh, play you her welcome message. But before I do, I want to remind you that this is a webinar. You have a live chat and please, during the presentations, which will start after the, the next session, so, so once we introduce the, the main speakers, please ask questions and we can note the questions and we'll have the speakers live here with me so I can ask them your questions after their presentations. So at any point, you can ask, you know, you can just uh, put your question in chat and I'll mark it and we can ask the, the, the speaker there. If you have a bad connection, please remember to just refresh your window and hopefully you'll be connected uh, back. So here's Tatiana with her welcome message. Dobar dan. As a Women in Data Science Ambassador, I welcome you to Vid Subotica 2020. My name is Tatiana Katsiewicz. I'm a data scientist with a doctorate in statistics from the University of Manchester. I have spent many years working in the UK university sector as a senior lecturer. I am the founder and director of Sister Analyst, an organization aiming to empower women from a diverse range of backgrounds through data literacy. In addition to my involvement supporting women in STEM related activities, I am dedicated to creating an inclusive culture by developing initiatives supporting all underrepresented groups within the data science community. The Women in Data Science initiative aims to inspire and educate data scientists worldwide regardless of gender and support women in the field, which started as a conference at Stanford in November 2015. Now, which includes a global conference with over 150 regional events worldwide, including a datathon, encouraging participants to hone their skills, a podcast featuring leaders in the field talking about their work and their journeys, and an education outreach program to encourage high school students to consider careers in data science, artificial intelligence, and related fields. Our event features outstanding women within the data science community. With Subotica welcomes anyone with an interest in data science. Our goals are to promote data science, exchange knowledge and create a data science community among women. We are fully inclusive and respectful of LGBT identities and welcome anyone interested in the field of data science. Due to the situation regarding COVID-19, we had to move our event online with a program containing five presentations by outstanding women directly engaged within the world of data science. The talks will provide an opportunity to hear about the advances and research in the number of data domains, learn how leading women in data are advancing and connect with potential mentor in the field. But 
Before we begin, I would like to thank, first of all, you for joining us this afternoon and for supporting our initiative. But most of all, our big thanks goes to our amazing presenters. Agnieszka Kaminska, who, with her background in cognitive neuroscience, will talk to us about building an efficient data processing pipeline with a focus on the critical importance of feature pre-processing using the example of human brain research. Željena Grbović will tell us how data science and in particular deep learning technique can be used in farming. Buena Soro will illustrate the application of data science in digital publishing industry by the possibilities of monitoring content performance through different dimensions using machine learning techniques to gain some valuable insights. Tiana Blagojev, as a NAR enthusiast, will focus her talk on the application of programming in R for media policy development. Finally, Maria Nobs will explain to us challenges of small data, from gathering data in a unified way and data cleaning to ever baffling challenge of modeling sparse data. I take a positive view that current situation will push for data-led social evolution by forcing for digital governance that facilitates developments of the healthier, safer, efficient, in other words, more democratic societies. Data, the lifeblood of our new global life system, is the key resource for addressing the big global challenges of today. Now, more than ever, data literacy should be treated as a crucial skill for pretty much everyone. That doesn't mean everyone needs to become a qualified data scientist. Only by empowering people at all walks of life, regardless of technical argument, to become more data literate, we can deliver greater innovation, transparency, stability in market behavior and improved social outcomes. Data analytics provide unprecedented instrumentation for how policies are performing so they can be quickly adjusted. Embedding those principles into a working global life system that is equitable and inclusive will take time. Nonetheless, with this pandemic, there is a growing awareness and consent on the need for data-driven societies, countries that are resilient, build upon the dignity of individuals, extraordinarily transparent and fully accountable. We believe that by connecting women data enthusiasts, discussing ideas and formulating outcomes, we contribute to a shared desire to resolve many of the challenges we face as human beings. And I hope you will enjoy being part of this process. At the end, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Data Science Serbia community for their encouragement and in particular special thank you to our partner Infostud for their amazing support. Wish you all to enjoy this event. Well, that was a nice intro and thank you Tatiana. So, before we get to the live q a sessions we need to hear some things so let's introduce our first speaker and get to the main event so our first speaker as tatiana said is agnieszka kaminska who is a data science enthusiast in her everyday work she combines analytical and research skills with machine learning knowledge in order to provide new solutions for product analysts purposes in olx group with her background in cognitive neuroscience, as Tanya just said, she will talk uh, to us about building an efficient data processing pipeline with a focus on the critical importance of future pre-processing using the example of human brain research. Hello, everyone. My name is Agnieszka Kaminska. I live and work in Poznań, in Poland. And today I'd like to discuss the topic of feature processing and its importance uh, in data science workflow. So uh, let me start uh, from short intro introduction. I'm uh, by profession, I'm product analyst working in uh, OLX group. And uh, during my everyday work, I try to find data scientific solutions for uh, making our product, our platform more adjusted to customer needs. Um, by uh, education and by passion, I, I am a cognitive neuroscientist and this is why I decided to uh, use of 
one of my uh, side projects uh, to show the bigger picture for the topic of today's talk. Um, very important part of my professional life uh, is being uh, a part of a global uh, organization, the uh, Women in Machine Learning and Data Science. Uh, I started uh, the Windows chapter in Poland uh, to connect uh, with other women, but also to support uh, people who are identified uh, as minorities in the field um, to cooperate, share knowledge and experiences, support each other. Um, feel free to reach out to me uh, after the event if you are uh, willing to discuss uh, the topic. Um, right, so uh, what is a, a feature uh, processing? So in, in brief, uh, it's a process of selecting, transforming and cleaning a uh, given data source. Uh, yeah, that's this more boring part. But uh, what is uh, exciting is a case when we are able to add some new relevant information uh, and create new variables uh, based on the domain knowledge. And you might say, uh, like, hold on, I'm a data person. Why are you talking about domain knowledge to me? So, yeah, this is actually why I wanted to um, talk about this particular talking, uh, topic uh, today, because uh, the more different uh, data and project I work with, uh, the more I'm standing on, on the position that this is a very crucial uh, part of the whole uh, process to try to at least understand at basic level uh, the problem uh, which is behind the data we are uh, working with. In majority uh, of business projects and uh, many research project, projects, uh, the ultimate goal is to get interpretable results. So uh, if we uh, put uh, some effort and take some time to create uh, or select features enhancing uh, this uh, final uh, effect, it's uh, definitely uh, worth uh, investing it uh, at the initial stage. Uh, but sure, we, we uh, need also some more practical uh, arguments. So uh, by avoiding redundancy among our features, uh, we can uh, easily reduce uh, computational costs uh, that are associated with the project. And for production context, uh, it's more time efficient uh, when implemented uh, model is less complex and uh for uh for example for uh online stream processing uh, it's also the performance issue now a few words about the project uh we were lucky to uh, take part uh, in this challenge uh, and uh, i mean uh, access to a uh, thousand of brains, brain sc scans, which is a completely untypical uh, situation in neuroscientific research when, uh, when these experiments uh, usually are very expensive. So uh, researchers end up uh, with uh, pretty small uh, data samples. Um, we, uh, and by we, I mean the team uh, we met during the weekend long hackathon decided to take part in a global neurocognitive prediction, prediction uh, challenge and the task was to try to predict a fluid intelligence score in children um, based on uh, brain scans. Um, uh, more precisely uh, we had two types of uh, data, uh, data types uh, for, for use. Uh, it was an uh, image of the brain itself and also uh, information about volumes uh, of uh, particular structures because the, there are many uh, individual differences uh, among people and, and uh, th this is a kind of uh, enriching information. Mm, when, uh, when it comes uh, to fluid intelligence, uh, let me briefly uh, explain what is uh, meant by this uh, psychological term. So uh, 
fluid intelligence uh, is derived from uh, human cognitive abilities theory, uh, where the general intelligence uh, is differentiated by uh, its developmental origin. Uh, so crystallized and fluid intelligence. And the former uh, includes acquired intellectu intellectual uh, skill set, which is connected uh, with education and socioeconomic background. While uh, fluid intelligence um, describes some general abilities like pattern recognition, abstract thinking, and problem solving. So it's more associated uh, with uh, inborn um, biologically based uh, features. These colorful sections of the brain you are observing here uh, reflect uh, anatomical division uh, from the standardized uh, atlas we were using. And uh, in short, this is a, a way of normalizing uh, data from a spatial uh, perspective. An interesting uh, idea of uh, challenge organizers to minimize uh, confounds uh, was to residualize uh, raw scores of fluid intelligence by the data collection side, um, socio demographic, socio economic uh, factors, and the total uh, brain volume. Um, what is uh, worth uh, mentioning, uh, we had. Uh, over uh, 8,600 uh, uh, brain scans uh, used but uh, for, for, for the whole uh, challenge, but the over uh, 4,400 uh, uh, brains were unseen uh, by, the, uh, by the model and they were used uh, for final evaluation of it. So now you have a, a general idea how uh, non-brain factors were uh, excluded from further processing. Some highlights uh, uh, of the project. So uh, we did a, a brainstorming uh, session and we came out with a um, pretty long list of new features we would like to create, but due to the uh, time constraints, as it was a weekend long uh, event, uh, we decided uh, to uh, select few of them, but each one was providing different kind of uh, information. When we discussed the model we would like to uh, use, uh, we knew that there is a trade-off uh, and we can invest uh, more time into tuning keeper parameters of convolutional neural network, for example, or use a simple, uh, more simple uh, model like regression and to uh, concentrate of uh, selecting features. Why uh, we decided to choose it? Uh, because we knew from literature that only up to 20% of uh, predicted variance uh, when it comes uh, to measured intelligence uh, can be explained by anatomical uh, structures. So. Uh, we used uh, MDA uh, algorithm to calculate uh, feature importance. Mm, mean, uh, mean decrease accuracy algorithm is not very common, I guess, uh, because it's not explicitly implemented uh, in Scikit-Learn, but it's uh, pretty handy. Uh, it takes uh, samples from the validation set and iteratively replaces uh, each uh, of its features with a random noise to check how the performance changes uh, when a feature is distorted. So the methods out output uh, is a weight for each feature that indicates uh, its importance for the model's performance. So basically this is how we uh, collected uh, our whole set of features. Just in case uh, you're curious what kind of uh, additional uh, information we added. Uh, for example, uh, we knew that different uh, part and different tissues uh, in, the, uh, in the brain uh, contain varied amount of water, what can be uh, measured uh, with a, a MRI uh, signal. So for example, by calculating uh, entropy, we were able to have some kind of surrogate uh, metric for assessment, uh, how much of uh, the gray matter uh, versus white matter uh, we can find uh, in a given area. So based on uh, MDA indications, uh, we chose 
uh, 141 uh, features. So, uh, so our initial uh, data set of over 540 uh, ones were um, highly uh, reduced. Yeah, I guess you are waiting for uh, algorithms. Um, so uh, uh, we compared performance of three of them, uh, support ve vector regression, random forest regression, and X-boost uh, regression. And here you can see the uh, uh, results we, we obtained uh, without uh, future prior future selection. Uh, for uh, for uh, competition um, comparison, uh, uh, it was, uh, quite typically used uh, mean square, uh, square uh, error we were trying to reduce. Um, and you might say that it's uh, pretty high. <laughs> and, and yes, you are right. But uh, what's uh, worth uh, keeping in mind uh, is that for uh, this kind of uh, complex uh, data structure and very uh, general uh, hypothesis uh, to test, because uh, here uh, fluid intelligence is uh, very in internally uh, diverse concept, which we are measuring uh, with uh, ver uh, very uh, simplified uh, one score. Mm, this is something you, you can just uh, expect to happen. So we knew that uh, we were taking part in competition and we have to uh, take a risk of model overfitting uh, by fighting to re reduce uh, uh, MSE uh, in a way uh, we are able to uh, do it. So um, after uh, including all features uh, selected, we were able to uh, decrease MSE uh, to a level of uh, 67.39. And you may now say like, hello, is it really a success? Um, well, it depends of uh, of your goal and and values uh, you are uh, working for. Uh, when you your dream was to see your name uh, on a leaderboard board, uh, yeah, <laughs> it was pretty successful. But when you keep in mind a broader context of explaining some uh, phenomena uh, we observe uh, in a, uh, in a re research research data, there is always a hunger for uh, further explanation. So this is uh, what um, what I keep saying uh, to my, myself when uh, when I'm digging uh, into the data. So now you may think uh, yourself like uh, she is talking about some nerdy competition, and how can I actually apply it to my everyday business work? Um, actually, I think you can. <laughs> um, because uh, most of business projects and uh, many research projects uh, focus on doing uh, something better than before, being more efficient, being better than competitors. And if we all are having uh, access to open, open source uh, tools, uh, from technological point of view, uh, there is a lot of uh, equality in uh, in this context. So, so the difference uh, you can make uh, is actually the way you are working with uh, your data, uh, the way you face the the challenge, um, and uh, the way how you understand uh, the problem you are working with. So, from from this uh, place, I highly recommend uh, to. Uh, Take some time and uh, try to better understand at least basics of the field you are thrown into uh, with your project. Of course, kudos uh, to my uh, great, great uh, brain hack team. And here uh, you have some resources listed. Okay, so we have done and we have. Agnieszka, live with us. Hi. Hello, hello. <laughs> Thanks. How are you? Oh, I'm really great. Thanks for having me today. And I'm really happy that, that uh, this event is actually uh, live here. So Yeah, it's actually live and we're having you live. So uh, thank you for the awesome presentation and, and all the work done before the actual event. So we already have some questions. Uh, and uh, everybody... Uh, uh, 
to all the viewers, just so you know, we have a limited time for questions. So we have about eight to 10 minutes. So I'm going to get right into the, the, the questions. Uh, Agnieszka, uh, why did you use MDA? Is it entropy based? Oh, uh, no. So the uh, entro entropy mentioned here uh, was referring only to the uh, one of features we have generated. So uh, it was the uh, our uh, idea to uh, create some proxy metric for how much uh, of uh, gray matter in a given uh, vo uh, voxel uh, which is uh, the uh, equivalent of uh, pixels in 3D. Uh, uh, how much of uh, this gray matter do we have? Because uh, plenty of research indicate that the, uh, the more uh, myelination uh, there is, so this uh, part of uh, uh, the uh, neural tissue, which is, which is crucial for uh, uh, tra transferring uh, signal in a proper well way, uh, the better uh, functionality of given area is. So, for example, uh, for uh, visual cortex, when you have high uh, myelinization, myelin sorry, uh, in uh, visual uh, visual uh, areas, uh, the better uh, performance of, of the cortex is. So that's why I mentioned entropy, and we. Uh, Chose uh, MDA because we we had hundreds of uh, features and we had some uh, knowledge based uh, features that actually uh, do dozens of them uh, to uh, to include to the model. So we wanted to measure uh, the uh, importance of, of features and uh, actually uh, the cutoff was a kind of arbitrary arbitrary because we uh, uh, we based on literature uh, just chose a 75th uh, percentile uh, for uh, for this uh, decision and when it comes uh, to MDA why because uh, also based on literature it uh, performs uh, well with three based models so uh, we expected that we uh, we can uh, accept uh, accept uh, the uh, mm, some some consistency uh, within our performance. We could uh, have more uh, informative uh, source of knowledge on why uh, we are selecting uh, those uh, features. So, actually, yeah. the weight weights. Calculate. Cool. So, yeah. uh, another question: Can you explain in more detail how the features were defined and how you made sure that they were independent? I assume they must have been in order to perform feature selection in the manner that you described. Yeah, yeah. So uh, actually, actually uh, there is uh, um, quite a lot of uh, details on how we uh, selected uh, those features. So uh, if you if you are uh, willing to catch up after uh, after the talk, uh, we can uh, we can discuss it more because plenty of them were uh, of anatomical uh, nature. For for example, uh, I didn't have time to uh, explain more. For example, based uh, on uh, th there was a, a picture of uh, corpus callosum, for example. So we were calculating matrix uh, for uh, um, proportion of uh, these uh, parts among uh, them. And when uh, it comes uh, to in the, uh, independency, uh, we also tested uh, all um, um, contribution of all uh, features uh, versus uh, random uh, random uh, noise. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and we have another question. So uh, do you know where did the MRI pictures put in the model come from and how were mm -hmm. they collected? Yeah, yeah. So the, there is whole documentation uh, for this project because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there, there was a huge in initiative which, which was, in fact, a cooperation between uh, plenty of institutions. So there were different scanners uh, and different uh, scanners parameters uh, following uh, the, uh, the data acquisition. So this is very, uh, very good point because uh, there are some studies suggest suggesting that if you don't clean data uh, and the noise coming from uh, 
uh, uh, just uh, scanner info uh, you can and you run or simply run a classifier you will classify uh, brains uh, regarding uh, the uh, equipment uh, which was used for uh, acquisition so all of this information uh, were um, de uh, described in details and were uh, removed uh, from uh, from the uh, data set. Plus there was this uh, intelligence residualization used, which also uh, makes it uh, more uh, relevant uh, for the uh, prediction process. Fantastic. So guys, if you have any more questions, we have only a couple of more minutes. Uh, while we wait for your questions, I'm going to ask one uh, that I have right here. So uh, I've got many women in tech struggle with some degree of to imposter syndrome. So have you ever felt as you were not good enough or technical enough to be where you are? And if so, how did you handle it? Hmm. So I, I I must say I deserve this question because when uh, Tatiana uh, reached out to me and asked uh, if I can uh, give a talk during uh, this event because uh, she was so happy that they are organizing Quits Botica, I said that, wow, that's so great that you're doing this uh, event uh, and I can recommend you great speakers. <laughs> so that was my first, uh, first answer. So uh, for sure, it, it happens uh, not only in tech, but also in academia, and, and it's quite uh, quite common. Uh, uh, so uh, to be honest, yes, sure, it happens to me uh, as well, but um, I'm, I'm thinking more uh, in a sense of, uh, you know, this uh, quotation, uh, which is in the Google Scholar, that you are standing on the uh, shoulders of giants. So this is something I, I, I keep in mind when I think uh, about my, my work, that uh, I'm uh, developing something uh, which, uh, yeah, which uh, is uh, so, um, I don't know, we, we have some some kind of treasure we have to uh, take care of right maybe it's too poetic but uh and and to uh, answering to the second part of uh question how do i handle with with, with that actually i would say there are two um two aspects of it so first i'm, I'm trying not, not not to compare to others but to myself from the past so uh i, I guess uh, if most of you look at your code from i don't know year uh, ago or to some old projects or to some old pr presentations you can notice a pro progress so this is uh, something that uh, keeps me motivated just to be uh, better uh, uh, than yesterday and to reach farther and this is one thing and and the other is to uh, keep uh, surrounded uh, by people from community who are great experts but are also very friendly people and it might s sound trivial but for example I know uh, people who are better than me uh, from some uh, at some point, uh, and I have a friend who is better than me, like in DevOps. I have a, a friend who is better than me in uh, writing a Pythonian code, which is through visual po poetry. Like I'm I, I need at to it, stop like... you because we need to we need to finish. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for being a part of Wit Super Twenty Twenty. Thank you for having me. I, I see a question about slides and yes, slides will be shared. And if uh, something was unclear, just just text me and, and I will explain in person. Cool. So bye bye. Okay, guys, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, we sometimes need to cut off the speakers. Probably will happen again. Uh, next speaker, Željana Grbovic, is a young researcher from at Biosense Institute uh, and a PhD student in electrical engineering at the University of Novi Sad. She's highly interested in the application of machine learning algorithms and deep learning in the field of agriculture. She will tell us how data science and in particular, deep learning technique can be used in farming. So let's go to that talk. Hello, everyone. My name is Jaliana Grbovic. I'm coming from Bioscience Institute, where I work as a researcher. I'm also a PhD student at Faculty of Technical Sciences, University of Navisad from Serbia. 
Today I will speak about VTR detection and automatic counting in RGB and thermal images using deep learning. So what we're gonna do? We want to make from conventional and traditional agriculture, we want to make smarter, more precise production in agriculture. So data science very easily enter in different domains. The same case is with agriculture. So, with available data from different kind of sensors, it is possible to make it smarter, preci more precise and connected production. This application would provide farmer to go on the field, take a photo of their crop and gain information about yield prediction of wheat. So, the number of years is one of the most important feature that contribute to obtaining yield prediction. Today, conventional methods for yield prediction are usually based on previous experience of farmers. Uh, when we speak about science, the plant breeding scientists manually count years within the frame of one square meter and that number later extrapolate to the whole field. The both of mentioned procedure are subject, uh, prone to subjective evaluation, so uh, these methods are just not sufficient precise. So using this application, the first benefit is to improve the efficiency of monitoring in crop management practices to make it easier for not just for bigger producers, but also for smaller ones. Also, manual work will be changed by the automatic approach of obtaining the ear density, saving more than 200 hours of labor, or when we speak about weeks, those are two weeks per location. Also, the very important thing is logistics. So, with the information of yield prediction, it will be possible to make optimal decisions in warehousing logistics. When we speak about the monetary value, using this application will prevent a significant loss of investments from a potentially reduced yield. How? The farmer will have a chance to act immediately. So when he, when he see the yield prediction at the moment of Im imaging, he can figure out that if it is below or it is average value for that growth stage of crop or for that season. So if it not, he, he, cannot, uh, he ca can act in a way of some treatments and try to save yield. On the screen you can see how we collect data from the field. We collect from two villages in Vojvodina, from Pajmok and from Ravno Selo in four dates, in two growth stage of crops. First, beginning of flowering when 10% of flowers of wheat are open, and the second one is early milk stage of wheat. Data sets consist of thermal images and RGB images. Both are collected by FLIR camera with two sensors. Thermal resolution is 440 by 480 pixels and it results in one channel image as color map where it is possible to see differences between differences in temperature between years and background. When we speak about RGB images, the resolution is higher, but those images are also cropped to be the same size as thermal ones to make it easier maintaining in later steps. RGB is three channel images with three channel, red, green and blue. On the screen you can see examples. On the left side thermal image and on the right RGB. It's some kind of um, obvious why we want to show how thermal imaging can bring benefits in ear detection and in segmentation task. We first collect more than 3,000 of images, but outdoor image acquisition 
faced with many problems. At the first place, unpredictable weather conditions, weather, position of sun, angle and height of image acquisition, etc. So we decided to take a look into data and find images that are right, that are good, without blur. But you can see on the, this example, it uh, could not be possible to find images without blur totally because uh, images are took uh, were taken in perspective. So that's the reason why those ears behind are blurred. So we chosen 138 of thermal images and 138 of RGB images. And later we divide the data set in ratio four to five uh, for train and test the subsets. So after wisely choosing images, appropriate images, we need we needed to find um, appropriate labels. So we decide to manual label um, and make binary masks. On mac masks, uh, white pixels belong to the ears and black belongs to the background. After we completed whole data set named as which data set, then was the time for finding appropriate architecture of convolutional neural networks. We make uh, we made a decision to uh, use these networks because um, it is wide known that this is the state of the art in computer vision and um, that the deep learning is a solution with high potential and very very good results. So uh, we decided to make from scratch our network and this network that we used um, consists of four blocks of 2D convolutional layers followed by L activation functions, batch normalization and dropout layer in order to prevent overfitting. Uh, after finding appropriate architecture, we finally got detected object, in this case ears in images. After that, we apply some post-processing steps as threshold to make results appropriate for applying next algorithm for automatic counting number of ears and we used a uh, algorithm based on connected components. When we speak about uh, network performances, it's not just all about accuracy, F1 score. F1 score is a uh, widespread used metrics for uh, segmentation. In case anybody you didn't hear till now. So, um, when we speak about model performances, we should take a look also in memory usage and require time for training. So, we find out that um, using ELO activation function, we could, uh, we can save um, approximately closely to 40% of memory usage, comparing to other two prevalent ELO activation functions. And also using this activation function, uh, we can save about uh, averagely half minute per training epoch. And of course, that does not affect on model performances in a way of accuracy and F1 score and other metrics that we use. So how uh, our model is accurate? When we speak about uh, pixels, because this is the pixel-based segmentation, for thermal images, our algorithm is accurate 92%. Uh, and when we speak about F1 score, it's accurate 75. In RGB images case, 67 and 68 respectively. Um, but uh, these metrics, they are good, but uh, they are not, uh, they not bring us sufficient information about how we uh, are accurate in a way of numbers of years. So we decide to manually count 
uh, the number of years in images before and after segmentation and after applying automatic algorithm for automatic counting. So we find out that we lost only three years per uh, both kind of images. So here you can see a few circles. Uh, here I would like to highlight uh, what the problems in, in a way of image processing uh, that we struggling and faced during this research. For example, first you can see that uh, there are uh, different size of ears on images. Also, um, when two, uh, when you can see two ears that are too close, that could mislead the algorithm to count them as one instead of two. So, um, near occlusion and overlapping and different size of ears in images. Also, uh, the huge challenge is outdoor image acquisition. So, for the future work, we would like to improve conditions of the image acquisition. First, uh, to adjust height and adjust angle of image acquisition. So uh, last season we made a new data set. It's still in process. Uh, we collected images uh, by smartphone and uh, by gadget thermal camera. And uh, we want to expand the database not just to go every season to collect more data, but we want to give better version of application to farmers to they give uh, some uh, feedback about experience and also as a crowdsourcing to to give them application to collect more data and on that way feed our network, feed our model and improve model performance. And uh, also, there is always uh, room for improve, improvement for um, architecture of network and finally to get uh, that prediction yield of wheat. So we have some preliminary results that are not published yet, but uh, stay tuned. Um, we uh, expect that um, soon we will have uh, some results published um, in a, in journal so here on the link you can see the what we published so far about this topic so uh, please take a look tuned. if you um, need more information we, uh, but also you can now that, ask um, some questions so and we will uh, have so i'm uh, open for your suggestions critics etc uh, so you can write in, uh, me on journal. email or so right now here on the link you can see and, the, um, what we published at so the end far i would like to thank you for your attention so and uh, of course a uh, huge thanks for inviting me to organize it thank you very much and um, i hope uh, you find something interesting here and uh, stay safe goodbye Well, that was a nice presentation, and we should have Jelena with us. Uh, Jelena, uh, can you turn your camera on, if you can hear me? Yes, I hear you. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Just okay. above, on the top of the window, there is a camera on link. Turn video on, above my head. Okay. Just... I don't see. Just uh, like uh, where you so ah, like okay. here. Uh, here. exactly. Yay! Hello, Zelena. Hi, hi everyone. Okay, cool. So, uh, whoa, I, I'm I'm always asking people leave questions during the presentation. So I I just got swamped with questions. So <laughs> such a nice calming voice, interesting research, or. Hope farmers will help you as much as you want to help them in the future. So that's what that was one comment. So just so that's you know. a great comment. <laughs> so how are you, Jelena? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm. I'm fine. Fantastic. Do you plan to enrich the data set with some data coming from the sensor describing the soil? Uh, nice question. Um, we uh, first want to make it uh, as much easier as possible uh, just to collect one type of data because if we collect different type uh, different types of data we um, maybe overload the the algorithm and whole pro uh, processing uh, 
progress. So uh, for gaining information, we will have uh, more seconds to, to reach the final information. So we want to make it uh, as fast as possible. So um, this is very good uh, proposition or suggestion, but we didn't uh, uh, taking in consideration the types and features of soil so far. But uh, in future uh, research, we, we can uh, add in this. Thank you. Fantastic. So the analysis of this big data would enable farmers and companies to extract value from it, improving their productivity. But what and how much farmers do need to learn about data science? Do you think it is important to them to be data literate as and how easy it is? Um, interesting question for someone who is geek. So I, I would say that it's very important for them to learn something about data. <laughs> but um, just to use application and just to get information that is very important for them, such as uh, yield prediction, uh, they uh, they don't have to be data literate. But if they want to contribute to improve this application or to learn something more, uh, I will suggest them to, to learn just about this application if they want to use it how to, what algorithms rely on, and etc. So um, uh, it's easier for them to use it, but if they want something bigger, it would be nice to learn something about it. Of course. So uh, again, guys, uh, viewers, ask questions uh, regarding the presentation while you think about it, because everybody's just saying, what a nice presentation, what a useful topic. So just, so, you know, you, you kind of circled it all. So I'm going to ask some, some uh, like general questions. So did you always know that working in STEM related field, in particular data science, was what you wanted to do? Um, I always uh, knew that I want to be in electrical engineering world, but uh, data science is just is just jumped as a decision uh, when I was on the last year in bachelor studies. That was the first time when I faced with the data science. So from then I'm just um, fell in love, and that's it. Cool. I'm gonna. Uh, we have one question that uh, kind of is adjacent to the the previous one. So, how hard is it to explain what a neural network is to a farmer? <laughs> um, <laughs> Valentina says her. <laughs> we we usually explain that that uh, that it's uh, similar like a human eye, and then we explain what uh, convolutional filters do as uh, similar parts as percept perceptrons of our eye. So in that way, they just know nothing. But I don't pretty much sure they they really understand but that is pretty much fine because uh, from a few months ago the scientists didn't know how exactly neural networks work so that's pretty much enough for me okay so um Zelena, what do you love about your job um uh, working in science is um interesting because um you don't have deadlines as for example if you work some project in companies but uh, it's interesting because you put your um, under pressure on your own so uh, of course we have some projects with that are connected with industry and co companies and that are usually short term so we we do it uh, but uh, when we speak about publishing it's always pressure because this is just the high topics and um, very often somebody uh, publish something that is maybe similar to you so it's just like a race so uh, I, I like that uh, <laughs> cool uh, uh, do you compare your work and results to some of USA or other countries work in the similar field uh, yeah now it's um, uh, on rely it would be the challenge worldwide known to uh, in a counting of a wheat so that was the first uh, competition where I want to test my algorithm and to see how is accurate and how is good uh, comparing to others. So uh, also um, in um, collaboration with the University of Strathclyde and the Agri Epicenter from Scotland uh, through uh, Dragon Project, uh, we will test uh, this algorithm uh, on other types of crops on barley first and on their wheat that is other species. Of wheat, so we're gonna see uh, from different sources how this uh, algorithm is really good. Well, what a fantastic presentation and what a fantastic flow! Everybody's just praising you. So I'm gonna ask one last question: What advice would you give to your younger self? 
what would you do different in getting into data science? Um, be braver and not um, so shy in expressing um, your first results. <laughs> and a great, uh, great uh, suggestion to all of you viewers. Zeljana, thank you very much for being with us at WITS 2020 Subotica Online. And what a great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. Okay, guys, next up is Boyana Soro, who is a data science analyst, sorry, data analyst at Content Insights. She has a master's in applied mathematics. She has studied financial mathematics at the University of Novi Sad, and she deals with data visualization, lab research, big data, mathematical modeling, statistics, data analysis, and optimization. So she will illustrate the application of data science in digital publishing industry by the possibilities of monitoring content performance through different dimensions using machine learning techniques to gain some valuable insights. Enjoy the presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Boana Soto. I am data analyst at Content Insights Company. I have studied financial mathematics at the University of Novi Sad. My field of interest is data science. Today, I will talk to you about content intelligence that informs content optimization. Every organization is realizing that in order to maximize their benefits, they require the magic of data science. Data science is shaping the new world where data is the necessity of the industry. It is becoming the most popular field across the globe because of its numerous applications. If you look at the world, it is totally digital and big data giants like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and thousands of many more consume the global economy and all of them use data science, machine learning or artificial intelligence. Data science becomes one of the most demanded jobs in today's digital world. Nowadays, there is no industry in the world that does not use data. This presentation will focus on data science applications in digital publishing industry. So, what we do? Content Insights is a startup company that is developing the next generation of web analytics services for evaluating content performance. Our mission is to help online publishers and content creators make sense of the amount of data and how to truly understand their audience without data analysts. We help them understand how to increase revenues without resorting to clickbait, how to grow without yielding to fake news. We want to fix online content space by empowering content writers to create quality stories, reach audience, and make sustainable business without clickbait titles and fake news. And how we do it? We do it by introducing people behavior metrics instead of browser matches. Online content is consumed by people, not browsers. To be able to work on our mission, we created an algorithm called Content Performance Indicator. It shows how well a certain piece of content is performing in comparison to other published articles on that particular website. Content perfor performance indicator explains what drive readers' behavior and give insights into how certain piece of content uh, resonate with the audience. Content performance indicator takes into consideration dozens of different content performance metrics and examines their relations. It also weights them differently according to three behavioral models, exposure, engagement, and loyalty. We do hard work 
of making connections and putting different metrics in context, noticing patterns and driving meaningful insights in order to make our client's decision-making process easier. Content Insights assists the whole newsroom in making data-informed decisions in the fast-changing industry. To achieve our goals and mission, we use data science. Today, I will present you one simple machine learning algorithm called clustering. It is basically a type of unsupervised learning method. Uh, unsupervised learning method is method in which we draw references from data sets consisting of input data without labeled responses. Generally, it is used as a process to find meaningful structure, explanatory underlying processes, generative features, and grouping inherent in a set of examples. Clustering is task of dividing the population or data points into a number of groups such that data points in the same groups are more similar to other data points in the same group and dissimilar to data points in other groups. It is basically a collection of objects on the basis of similarity and dissimilarity between them. The most commonly used clustering method is k-means. To explain concept of k-means method, I will use one simple example. Imagine you are opening a small bookstore. You have a stack of different books and three bookshelves. Your goal is place similar books in one shelf. What you would do is pick up three books, one from each shelf, in order to set a them for every shelf. These books will now dictate which of the remaining books will go in which shelf. Every time you pick a new book up from the stack, you would compare it with those first three books and play this new book on the shelf that has similar books. You would repeat this process until all the books have been placed. K-means algorithm works something like this. K-means clustering is a good place to start exploring an unlabeled data set. The K denotes the number of clusters. The algorithm is bound to converge to a solution after some iterations. It has four basic steps. First step is initialize cluster centric. Second step is assign data points to clusters, then update cluster centric, and final step is repeat step 2 to 3 until the stopping condition is met. There are uh, some results. The first uh, chart represents four metrics. We have article reads, unique visitors, new visitor and social actions. This result is uh, without applying clustering algorithms. On the next slide is bar chart but with applying k-means algorithm on articles. We have three clusters. There, uh, the articles are separated by article length into two groups. Short articles, semi-long articles, and long articles. We can note difference in metrics depending on the article length. So we can see that all of these four metrics are the highest by long articles. And these lines representing trend. And we can see that we have growth in all of these four metrics. In the next level, we can compare free and paid articles. Again, we observe same metric, metrics and articles are separate.
separated by Article 1. But in this segmentation, we can compare performance of articles depending on article type. We can conclude that paid articles have higher value than uh, free articles. Also, we can compare distribution of number of articles depending on article length. On the left side chart, we have distribution of free articles. It is clear that almost half of free articles are short articles. On the other, on the other hand, chart on right side shows totally opposite distribution in paid articles. Here are dominant long articles, and uh, while number of short articles is very low, only 6%. So distribution of free articles and distribution of paid articles are completely different. From these few examples, we can conclude that results with clustering have more informative approach than result without clustering. And for the end, I will conclude with k-means advantages. What are advantages of k-means algorithm? Relatively simple to implement. You can implement this algorithm in R, uh, in Python, or any other language. Scales to large data sets, gar guarantees convergence, and that is very important that uh, when you have an algor algorithm, that you have convergence. Can one start the position of centroids, easily adapt to new examples, and uh, generalize to clusters of different shapes? And size. With advantages of k means, I conclude my speech. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask and I will do my best to answer. Thank you so much for your interest and for your attention, and thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Well, hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, we're just waiting to see if Boyana can connect. Uh, we're gonna give her uh, a couple of minutes. Um, okay, uh, just one second. And she should be with us in just a moment. So I'm gonna ask everyone uh, to please um, just uh, keep, um, Keep your mind, ask questions while the presentations are going and uh, so we can have questions prepared. Buena, hi, welcome. Hi, hi, thank you. So good to have you here on WIDS uh, Subotica Online. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was awesome. Okay, mm -hmm. so I love your company. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I have one question right out of the box. Have you considered any other algorithms for unsupervised classification? And if so, which? Yeah, yeah, uh, we can consider uh, other algorithms and uh, it can, uh, more, most algorithms to uh, cluster and uh, to clusterization. But uh, in this presentation, I explain uh, k-means, but you can uh, choose uh, something like hierarchical uh, clusterization or tree clusterization or something, something like that. There have many options, but uh, these uh, in this presentation, we uh, do this King's uh, algorithm. Okay, how often do you perform model retraining for your type of the problem? Uh, it depends uh, from uh, case to case, but uh, we can uh, do this when uh, it, it, it has the need to um, perform uh, that. Okay. Do you analyze the inside of the text? For example, topic, frequent words. Yeah, yeah. We analyze uh, this uh, in uh, in three seven in uh, four seven. We analyze uh, 
sections. We analyze topics, articles, and uh, authors from these articles. And uh, from uh, each of these uh, segmentation, you can uh, you can compare your results and uh, you can uh, find analytics for each of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, what was one of the challenges that you encountered with working with publishers? Um, uh, I uh, work in the uh, lab team. Uh, my colleagues from Success uh, work more with uh, cu with customers, but uh, I think that uh, it is a big challenge to uh, explain uh, them these uh, uh, these numbers. What does it mean in uh, in uh, actually? Um, are there any uh, other behavior metrics we can use? This is mostly click data, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, we have um, we have a metric, our metric that is article rate, and that uh, that is uh, not like page view. Page view is only uh, when you click on the site, and our metric article rate is uh, when you click on the site. 10 minutes, uh, 10 seconds later, uh, you uh, you uh, got this uh, this metric. Uh, okay, so while we wait for uh, for other maybe viewers to ask any questions, so what do you think are the most effective ways to make the case for diversity in an organization, and what strategies do you see as key for developing innovative and diverse teams? Mm -hmm. Uh, in my opinion, the most effective way to make diversity in one organization is to uh, think about diversity from the start of the process and uh, address all the aspects of the uh, diversity. And uh, it is very important, important to celebrate uh, differences between team members. And second part of the question about strategy, uh, I think the key of developing uh, innovative teams is in having people who are different, uh, who are different age, different uh, uh, gender, different uh, backgrounds, and uh, that that um, uh, are uh, that developing uh, innovative uh, team and uh, that bring you new ideas, achieving your uh, goals and success. Uh, success you know in your company or your uh, organization okay Boana, we have another question regarding the presentation so what's different from example gtm events like scroll time on page clicks copy texts uh, excuse me can you repeat what's different from example gtm events like scroll time on page clicks copy texts Mm, I think I should uh, think about it, but. Uh... Okay, we can leave it for yeah. for another time, sure. or you can you can uh, you can contact uh, Boyana uh, directly after the, the the webinar, and and she can uh, answer more elaborately. Do you monitor readers' activity around text, for example, whether they've come to it from another content at the same site whether they leave or stay yeah yeah uh, we uh, we can check uh, all of these activity of uh, readers and uh, we uh, we uh, do this by uh, a user cookie and we can check uh, when reader uh, go to the site or uh, to site to articles uh, how read articles uh, how uh, deep read articles that uh, only uh, click article and then close or uh, read uh, total articles or read uh, a part of articles we can we can um, do all all of this uh, all of this with, with fantastic text. so so for the last question what advice would you give to someone looking to grow their uh, uh, you know career in data science Mm -hmm. Great question. Uh, because uh, I, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's very, uh, it's the most important that you love uh, that your job and the, that you enjoying uh, doing doing your job. Uh, 
After that, that is important uh, which field uh, of uh, data science you uh, you are preferred. Uh, that uh, that means that uh, you you could uh, find your area of data science. Uh, do, that uh, could be data analysis, data engineering, uh, machine learning, engineering, or uh, something else. When you uh, find your field of interest, it is very important to uh, everyday learning. Every day, uh, learn something new, new uh, knowledge, new uh, programming language, uh, new uh, algorithms, and every day uh, learning something new. And um, when you uh, start with data science, uh, it is my my advance is to be to begin uh, from something that is simple, from simple concepts, simple alg algorithms. And uh, it is important to uh, understand the essence of, uh, con of uh, concept, and then you will be able to upgrade your knowledge. And my uh, suggestion is good luck and go ahead. Fantastic. Boyana, thank you very much for being with us at with Subatits Online. Glad to have you. What a fantastic presentation. And uh, please join us back in the in the to watch the webinar. Uh, I'm gonna link you a question that we could not answer and so you can answer in chat yeah. so Thank cool you. everybody we're going uh, to the next uh, presentation immediately next is tiana blagoev uh, who holds a master degree in politics big data and quantitative methods from the university of warwick uh, as an r enthusiast she will focus her talk on the application of programming in r for media policy development so Good luck. Let's uh, check out her presentation. Hello, my name is Tiana Blagwev and I will be talking to you about uh, programming in R as a tool for assisting media policy development. First of all, let me give you a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I'm currently working as a program assistant at the media department of Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe in Serbia. And we are following developments in freedom of expression in the country, organizing training for journalists, and providing support to establishing adequate media policy. Uh, also, I have an MA degree in politics, big data, and quantitative methods at the University of Warwick, which I got through Chevening Scholarship. Uh, this was an opportunity for me as a person with no computer science background to learn quantitative analysis and programming in R, which was a great experience to have. Um, I'm also one of the co-organizers of Our Ladies chapter in Belgrade. And for those of you who are not familiar with, this is an organization that promotes gender diversity in our community through different trainings, workshops, lectures, mentorships, and I have been giving uh, lectures uh, both in UK and in Serbia. Um, uh, let me give you a bit of general idea of what media policy development is and what uh, me and my colleagues do. So we are monitoring implementation of media legislation. We are assisting academia in various researches and supporting them in developing programs for journalism students. We are supporting various analyses of media situation in Serbia that can be baseline for changes in media policy. And finally, we are providing suggestions for improvements of media laws. Uh, during this process, I noticed there was a lot of data gathered and I was thinking uh, what, if one would uh, present them visually or do some analysis, this could contribute even more to the media policy development. And that is why I started searching for uh, MA degrees that would uh, allow somebody with non-scientific background uh, to learn programming and that is how I met R. And why I love it? It is because it is an open source because it is a good programming language for data analysis and visuals. Um, it has a great community that allows people to connect, uh, to solve many issues, uh, to exchange ideas. Um, it is a subjective thing, but for me, R and R Studio are very intuitive. And knowing R can help you learn more easily other programming languages. Um, R comes with different packages, uh, which are bundles of code and functions for specific purposes. And I will talk to you a little bit about Shiny, uh, the package used for developing web apps. 
and uh, our markdown that is flex dashboards that is used uh, for uh, creating dashboards with different visuals. And I will show this to you through two examples. One is government funding of media in Serbia, which was my dissertation topic. And the other one is a test version for a research done by media expert Medim Sedinovic on media that are providing information in minority languages, again in Serbia. So let us go to the first example. Uh, this is a web application of data on project-based co-financing of media content in public interest. And now you must feel something along these lines. Uh, so I will actually simplify it and say that it is a government financing of media through projects. So let us go and see how this uh, web application look like. Uh, so uh, this is data gathered by Ministry of Culture and Information uh, through the pr process of um, media strategy development. And it was in Excel spreadsheet and it covered year 2015, 16 and 17. I received this from Independent Journalist Association of Vojvodina. I was thinking maybe it would be uh, good and user friendly if uh, instead of Excel spreadsheet one could e more easily look at uh, uh, how the funds were given to dif uh, by different municipalities to which media and uh, how, how much of that money was given to them. So um, you could see uh, all this information. This information is actually in British pounds. Uh, you can see how much uh, who uh, gained the most money like RTV Novi Pazar for example. And uh, also you can uh, go and take a look at a particular uh, municipality and see how the funds were distributed through years or search for in this corner, uh, upper corner, uh, right corner, uh, like for example Radio Far, uh, and see how much money it, it gained uh, through ye throughout years. Um, this is actually a very good thing because, uh, first of all, it supports open data initiatives. This data at the moment is not publicly available and it would be really good if they were. Um, when it is publicly available, it can be validated by journalists, by media experts and uh, the errors uh, mistakes could be corrected. Um, if Ministry of Culture, for example, would be interested in taking on this uh, web application with minimum of training and uh, filling in of uh, um, uh, data uh, in Excel spreadsheet, they could easily update it for the coming years. Uh, it can uh, better target trainings uh, in case some organizations are doing trainings, they can see the distribution of funds regionally. Um, it can be also good for supporting legislative changes and improving the entire process. And finally, public themselves can provide evaluation of the process because in their own local communities they know these media, they know uh, how their uh, how the programs look like and uh, whether they fulfill public interest or not. The second thing is to, uh, I will talk to, uh, to you about R Markdown and reproducible research. R Markdown is a package within R that is combining code and text and results of your work. It is very good because uh, you can um, uh, follow somebody else's work and somebody else can follow your own research and then can contribute to it more easily. And you can with it develop uh, documents, websites, books and dashboards that I will uh, now show you. So, um, as I already said, uh, this is a, a test version of uh, the data gathered uh, for a research done on uh, media that are providing uh, information in minority languages. So, uh, let us again see uh, how this looks like. Um, I'm apologizing that it is in Serbian, uh, and uh, but still you can see uh, in a nutshell this is the number of minority media, general information about the project, this is the number of media uh, uh, for a particular language like Hungarian, Roma, Slovakian, Albanian, and you can see where these media are geographically, uh, and if you are for example interested in a particular media you can get more information, usually for uh, radio TV stations, uh, uh, you will be uh, you will see uh, the information from the regulatory body for electronic media or in case there is no information like for example uh, I think this one uh, you will get uh, that there is no online information about this uh, media uh, another good thing is that you can get different tabs with tables additional information contact email address but the, the good thing about Flex Dashboards is that you can actually connect uh, Shiny uh, and uh, Flex Dashboards for more complex things. 
uh, for example I will now show you uh, the exactly same web website uh, but you can here download uh, in CSV or Excel uh, um, the file the, uh, the data that was gathered and this is great because this allows your research first of all uh, to be um, in a way used by others for their own research uh, they can also in consultations contribute with correcting your own work um, because it is public it is actually transparent and uh, this is a, a simply great thing to do um, Another advantage is, uh, advantage is that it is a kind of a storytelling thing. Um, it allows uh, audience to uh, get more uh, uh, engaged and it is an interactive presentation and I know that usually media policy uh, topics sometimes can be some daunting and not very attractive to general public but with this you get more engaged uh, more uh, more interested public and audience and maybe uh, proactive and also you can use these dashboards not only in the media policy area of course you can use it uh, in finances project development monitoring of expenditure literally the sky is the limit and why do all this? Uh, because in the era of disinformation and fake news, uh, data literacy is very important for people to know, to understand uh, the use of graphs, proper use of graphs, and also basic statistics, and they can learn this along the way. Um, interdisciplinarity, by knowing skills and knowing R, you get acquainted with people of uh, different, diverse backgrounds, and this can actually have an influence on your own work. Uh, and spark many ideas and collaborations. It is, as I already said, a vision and reproducible research, but also it allows you uh, to have a skill that can make your research more publicly available and more uh, attractive to be followed and read. And uh, transparency and openness I already stated, so the important is, I importance is there. And finally, for journalists themselves, they can um, actually uh, accompany their articles with uh, these and um, at least uh, have again uh, uh, attract more audience and uh, have more engaged audience and maybe hopefully at least to a small, small ex extent help their sustainability. So I hope that I did not overwhelm you with uh, too much information in my lecture. I hope you found it interesting. Here are some additional resources that you might find useful about introduction to R, about Flex dashboards, Shiny, as well as some examples of my work. Um, and uh, yeah, well, this is the first and last time I will be together with Keanu Reeves, but since this is a screenshot of my presentation, I thought maybe you would like to see how I look like and say hi to me in the street. Anyway, thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to the questions you might have. What a fantastic presentation, Tiana. Good job. Uh, Tiana is with me. You can uh, turn on the camera, Tiana. It's just uh, here above my head. So, uh, and also the mic, uh, if you can hear me. Uh, and uh, awesome, awesome questions. We have uh, loads of questions to you. Uh, Tiana, are you with me? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. The the video, turn the video on, is just about like where I'm pointing somewhere yeah, above my head. Yeah, it is not allowing me to turn it on for some reason. Maybe it's a connection problem here. It's a real uh, uh, thunderstorm outside, so I'm not sure. It doesn't allow me to. Okay, so we're going to do audio, and that's the, the most important part. So uh, to the viewers, uh, Tiana is still with us and can answer questions. So I'm going to dive right in. Uh, tidyverse or base R? Oh, yeah. Uh, that is a very usual question to ask. And since in academia, when I was studying, they were saying to us never to use ggplot2 and always to use base R. As soon as I graduated, I decided that tidyverse is something that I want to do more. So maybe for others would be base R, but for me, tidyverse, definitely. Okay. Is there any possibility for those data sets to be released in open data format for journalists to validate? 
I completely agree. Uh, that is a great question. And that is one of the reasons why I started doing this, because uh, we are doing this media policy uh, changes and hoping that they will open these data sets. So I really hope it will be possible. And with showing this, what can be done and even the ministry to participate, maybe that would urge them to open them so that journalists can validate, because that is very important to do. Oh, fantastic. Uh, I completely agree. I also find it fascinating. So I, I, I want to see the, just the information, not the data science. So uh, how exactly. difficult <laughs> was it to jump into R and programming, going from zero to hero? Do you have any advice for someone who'd like to jump in, jump in as well? Yeah, well, uh, I know it can be daunting uh, and uh, I can understand that completely, uh, but uh, I was really enthusiastic about it because uh, I like to see uh, how data uh, can be visualized and uh, that was some kind of a uh, urge for me to do these kind of things. And if anybody has interest in it, uh, I would suggest uh, either to see um, our studio uh, blogs and stuff, or also to check if they are journalists or interested in mass communications. There is a great book, uh, Practical R for Journalists and Mass Communications but, uh, by Sharon McLeese, uh, because these are kind of things uh, that can help in different areas people to understand the topics and then understand how to connect programming language, language to these topics. So uh, with that, I think it is more more uh, friendly uh, to, to start from zero and to become a hero, though I'm not sure whether I'm to that stage now. <laughs> do you do sentiment analytics in R? And if so, do you translate Serbian to English? If not, what is a drop in accuracy? Yeah, I don't do that. I think it's a great thing to do. Uh, but I have to say um, there is a pinch of salt to think about it because Sentiment analysis, as such, depends on uh, uh, on wordings and texts, as far as I understand, and uh, some things are not uh, uh, built that way. So uh, I think uh, some professionals, apart from uh, people who really do know how to do sentiment analysis, uh, should uh, work together to sort these kind of things and make sure it is uh, proper and appropriate to, to publish it, for example. Um, um, you have a you comment. Have a comment. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing myself, hearing myself double. double. Uh, you, uh, are, you are, ladies, ladies are amazing. Are amazing. <laughs> what actions and from whom do you propose for educating journalists and media experts in benefits of open data, data literacy, and importance of better data visualization in newspaper and media portals? I just didn't quite catch the so beginning. What, what actions and from whom do you propose for educating journalists in this? Well, I, yeah, I would say um, uh, the OSC does uh, provide trainings and uh, also uh, sister analysts do certain uh, projects uh, related to support to journalists. And uh, I think uh, that would be like a starting point if somebody would like to do or they can contact me as well. I can I can make sure that they can get in touch with the proper people to do this. I think that's a great idea. That's something that I'm very enthusiastic about to provide this to them. Uh, okay, so a question that uh, where do you publish in shiny apps like shinyapps.io or do you deploy shiny server on some cloud service? Uh, for the time being, shiny.io. Cool. Uh, what packages do you find most useful? Uh, tidyverse, <laughs> tidyverse uh, but also um, sometimes uh, I like, I mean, of course, uh, Shiny, R Markdown. R Markdown, is, I think, is maybe uh, very good uh, to be included in academia uh, because uh, it allows your research to be reproducible. Uh, I know it is a kind of a difficult thing to, to involve uh, people to do this, uh, maybe in Serbia especially. Uh, but I think if there are people who are interested in doing some kind of things, they can only contribute to better uh, to better researches and more collaboration. Well, you just answered all the questions from viewers and we're out of time. Uh, so, Tiana, thank you so much. It was an awesome presentation and thank you so much for being part of WIDS Subotica 2020. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye.
Okay, guys, we have one last presentation. It's Maria Knorps, uh, also uh, from Poland. And Maria is a data scientist, scientist, sorry, my English is slipping, uh, creating analytics, BI, and machine learning solutions from the data collection to the web development. She will explain to us challenges of small data from gathering data in a unified uh, way and data cleaning to ever baffling challenge of modeling sparse data. Now, you should be aware that Maria unfortunately called us and told us that she cannot attend the live event because of some uh, urgent matters. So she will not be here for the Q&A session, but stay with the presentation. And after the presentation, we will hear from uh, Tatiana Ketsovich, who is the organizer and you know who collected all these five ladies. So we go to Maria's presentation. In data science, we often walk in the realm of big data. Today's talk will be on challenges of small data. There are many companies that gather data for years and it still does not exceed few dozens of megabytes. The information and business supporting insight are still there, but we have to find a way to extract it and smartly because there is not much to extract from. Today I will describe challenges in dealing with small data on example of perfume industry. Our client is a perfumer. They sell their fragrances to cosmetic companies, which order fragrances of specific characteristic, for example, fresh and citrusy. And of course, the fragrance should be well liked by people. And how does a perfumer can check if their fragrance is well liked? They order market research, where individual clients uh, tell if they like the fragrance, if they had the proper attributes, and why are we needed in there, why, are, why that data science is needed there. Uh, we can assist with constructing fragrances that are better liked by people based on his historical data. Uh, we can also help to find some ingredients that do not have any impact on liking or any other attributes of uh, fragrance and this costly so it could be a uh, cost optimization of perfumes usually customers data consists of three parts it's customer tests aggregated tests and formula ingredients our goal is to find which ingredients should or should not be included in the fragrance to fill the requirements of the uh, cosmetic company. So the main goal is to find, uh, find data that, is, that connects the customer tests and formula ingredients. The challenge is the amount of data there. Uh, the client thinks that uh, half a million of uh, Excel lines is a lot, but in fact it is not because it aggregates to 1000 customer tests and formulas, we usually have around 300, 400 of them. So the data is really small, but still we can say some interesting things about it. We will, in further slides, we will decompose the graph that is presented here and see which, uh, which part generates what obstacles. Let's start with customer tests. Uh, <clears throat> the data in customer test is, of course, test IDs, so we, had to, we have to have a way to identify it. Uh, respondents' characteristics like age and gender and uh, place of stay and impression of fragrance, liking, strength of fragrance, buying intention, attributes that fragrance possesses. And customer test may be done in uh, several methodologies. One is uh, a typical 
one is triangle test where each person is given three samples. One of those samples is a benchmark, so it's a well-known perfume which has similar characteristic. <clears throat> and customer may need to say if they like the fragrance or not. Uh, second type of test is pair test, where two samples of different fragrances are compared. And monadic test is the third one, where only one sample without reference is tested. And this one is usually uh, done for new fragrances, some totally new ideas. And for the triangle test, we also have to be very... Uh, aware of if the test is done correctly uh, because people tend to say that they like the first thing they smell so in here you see the uh, dependence on of liking the higher the liking the people like it better uh, on order of testing it's the same perfume so if it was tested as first it gets considerably better liking, like around four, than when it was tested as a second or third, because then it, it's almost all of the people say it's one, so they really don't like it. And another challenge is normalization. For example, we have two scales, from one to five and from one to seven. First scale was used to <clears throat> to uh, score strength of perfumes in years up to 2016 and from 2017 they use from 1 to 7 and right now if you want to compare the results between those years we have to normalize it somehow but the normalization of scale even if it's ordered it's not that uh, straightforward uh, maybe for statistics like like mean or median it will be okay but for statistics like top box where top box is the percent of people who ga who gave the highest score it's not straightforward uh, much between top box 5 and top box 7 the solution in here is to consult with the business and to understand uh, how people would behave, how should we match those two together. Another challenge in customer data is formula ingredients. Uh, the client may give us the formula ingredients in encoded form, which is for his safety the best way, because uh, they do not uh, give us any, any secrets of the company. On the other hand, when they give us explicit uh, formula ingredients, we can see some discrepancies and we can maybe find if the data was collected correctly. Uh, the example we have is uh, we had several perfumers uh, working for one company which have the same program they exported the data from, but the export preferences might be different. Might have been different. But the export preferences uh, one, might be different. One of the perfumers grouped different. their ingredients uh, one, and the other did one not. Of the perfumers grouped and their if ingredients the formulas and the other were, did not. Uh, and if were the formulas were uh, encoded, were group, it would not were, be that easy uh, to find and code what, it, it would uh, not be that easy. There was a difference in export. Uh, the same problem, a bit, maybe a bit similar, is when the ingredients are named very in similar fashion. So there is a one core name and, uh, for example, point 0.1, point 0.3 and uh, other different uh, <clears throat> ends of the name of ingredient. Sometimes those mean the same ingredient, but just the name is different. And this can be found when the names are explicit. Uh, from this one, we've learned that uh, you should check consistency of data and each and every step. 
because even if uh, if everyone thinks it's clean and it's it will work better check uh, another challenge with ingredients is that number of ingredients it's over one and a half thousand and only for less than 10 formulas we have uh, 1200 ingredients that means that 1200 ingredients uh, you may find them in less than 10 formulas so the matrix is very sparse so there is a lot of uh, uncommon ingredients it will not be that easy to capture their uh, their importance in the in the fragrance impact on customers and another part is the matching finally we use aggregated uh, tests and formula ingredients but even there there was challenges because in aggregated data we had several uh, candidates for key uh, of the match there was internal code internal name and code on the other hand for formulas we have only code but how did it look internal code and internal name they seemed a bit similar than the code they should match in formula ingredients but they did not match uh, we could use very special rules for matching but it would be inefficient and error error prone uh, that's why we uh, had a lot of conversation with client to uh, better export the data so it would match better and we created data dictionary that for each of those tables so customers test aggregated data ingredients they describe which uh, which column indicates what uh, what part of the business unfortunately we could not well match customers tests with aggregated data customers tests were on very detailed levels so we could uh, have more information from it but to match aggregated data and ingredients was enough and yet another part of our uh, experience here is that apart from data dictionary we also create data map based on that so we know exactly which uh, which part of data should be matched with which part of uh, in other tables and we also learn to avoid special cases so if we see that the match is okay but some of the cases uh, well maybe not uh, not that good we try to find the general rule and not uh, implement uh, special cases uh, our tech stack for these projects was uh, python and view for data analysis and visualization uh, we used haskell when reliability mattered um, from databases we used Elasticsearch and MariaDB uh, one is NoSQL and another is uh, relational and uh, we also experimented with uh, data ver version control DVC uh, but we did not like it at least not for data cleaning part and just to summarize documentation good exploratory analysis and communication with a client can help you face the challenges of small data. Thank you very much. And we're back and, and the final presentation is over. And for the end, I'm sorry not to have Maria, but I have Tatiana Ketsevich. Hi, Tanya. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. So, uh, Tanya, thank you for organizing and you know bringing these five fabulous ladies together to give us such uh, awesome presentations. It was a pleasure, you know, I really have to thank to all the presenters and especially InfoStood for, you know, giving us the support we really need. And thank you very much, Jaiko, for helping us organizing this. 
It was my pleasure. So, Tanya, what are, are some of the plans for uh, women in data science in Serbia uh, over the next period? Well, we are trying to connect regionally, uh, and uh, we uh, are already connecting uh, with, with Croatia, with uh, Sarajevo. So hopefully, you know, watch for the space and, you know, we're going to have bigger and greater events in the future in the region. Cool. And what about our ladies? Oh, our ladies are going strong. Uh, we have two chapters in Serbia, uh, one in uh, Belgrade, uh, one in Novi Sad. And uh, there is an opportunity to start uh, our ladies in niche, but as with everything, like often women find difficult to just break the ice and step into the scene. But I'm hoping the girls down in niche will do it. Okay, so do you have a closing message for everybody viewing? Yeah, I would uh, like to say, well, wow, uh, it's been truly thought-provoking two hours for me. Uh, and uh, thanks to all presenters, you have done an outstanding job sharing with us your valuable knowledge, insight, and experience on how to empower women in data science field. Thank you very much. Uh, this year, we were aiming to gather a number of women in data science, not just from Serbia, but to connect regionally. We were also intending to engage with young women still attending local universities. However, despite not being able to go ahead with our originally planned program through this online event, we have managed to bring together a number of inspirational women directly engaged with data science within the region. It has been certainly motivated and uh, galvanizing, uh, and uh, we should build up on this to create a stronger regional community within the global leads. It will provide us with the opportunity to outreach to women and young girls in more remote places within the region. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I have a little girl who's just turned the TV on. Uh, that's what happens when you... It's not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so really, encourage, encouraging, inspiring and empowering uh, women, uh, it's what Women in Data Science stands for. Uh, and let me once again express my sincere thanks to all of you for coming and for contributing to the discussions. And really, uh, finally, uh, it's time to officially close with Subotica 2020 conference. Uh, and I sincerely hope that we'll meet up next year in greater number and next in happier year. circumstances. <laughs> Thank you. Fant <laughs> fantastic. And what a great closing of the event. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> okay, so we have a very nice closing. Uh, Tanya, thank you so much for organizing the uh, the ladies. And ladies, thank you so much for the presentations. And to all the viewers, thank you for being with us uh, on this uh, with Subotica 2020 online edition. We will see you on the next webinar, on the next event, and stay close. Talk thank you, you and see you next year. Bye. Bye.